All right, hello everyone. So for those of you that I haven't met yet, my name is Adam Shuttler, and I'm the president of the Calgary Alumni Branch. I didn't even get a full sentence put <laughs> yet. Um, as well as a strategic committee member for this year's AVS. I have the pleasure of introducing a remarkable individual to you today. Paul Juniper is the director of Queen's Industrial Relations Centre. He, he is a leading and respected figure in Canada's HR community with over 30 years experience in association leadership. Paul is particularly sought after uh, for his views on the future of the human resources profession. He speaks at national and international conferences on trends in human resources and the way individuals and their organizations continue to raise the bar on HR. He teaches on Queen's IRC, ad, IRC's advanced HR succession planning and linking HR strategy to business strategy programs. He, his research focuses on state of the HR profession in Canada and around the globe. Throughout his career, Paul has volunteered on national health and financial services boards, often taking leadership roles, including the Human Resources Professionals Association of Ontario. He currently volunteers as a member of the advisory board for the Banff Center for Leadership and is a vice chair for the Agnes Etherington Art Center Advisory Board. So without further delay, please give a warm welcome to the very tall and well-spoken <laughs> Paul Juniper. Thank you. You know when they have these programs, what's supposed to happen is you're supposed to have the really good speaker at the end and build to a crescendo. But I was here for the first speaker this morning, and wasn't she wonderful? Yeah. Uh, so that's a seriously tough act to follow, and so I want you to understand that if this doesn't work out, <laughs> you want to talk to him, okay? And so, um, Adam and, and Sarah, for what's about to happen, I truly apologize. <laughs> Um, if you were expecting that I'm going to stand up here and talk to you for an hour and a quarter about succession planning and how to do it and basically um, use the format of this room that, you know, I'm at the front and I'm important and, and you're up there and you're going to listen and I'm going to fill your empty head with what I know, then I have very bad news for you because that's not what's about to happen here. The IRC, which is where I worked from 1937, and we do skill-based training and we do facilitated discussion based on adult learning principles. So what that means is you're going to do most of the work. So if you are in the middle of an erotic fantasy or thinking about lunch, <laughs> I would like you to know that you need to come back into the room just for a few minutes and give me a chance, okay? <laughs> um, I promise you that lunch is going to be good, so you don't need to worry about lunch, all right? Um, <laughs> oh, we're going to leave that one alone. <laughs> um, so Sarah, you should know, is a very, very good negotiator. So when she called me and said, would I come and do this, I said no. And she, <laughs> and she said, but, but, but. And in the end, here I am. So uh, how many of you either have kids, want to have kids, or were a kid? <laughs> okay, so do you understand then the concept of malicious compliance? So I was in Australia three weeks ago and I got this lovely, lovely email from Sarah. She does wonderful emails. If you haven't had one from her, you should get one because they're fantastic. <laughs> and she said, Paul, it's about the slides. I want you to know where everything's getting ready. We're really excited. It's going to be a really good program. And it would be really nice if you could send us your slides so that we could put them on the computer so that they'd be ready and so everything will be, will be set to go. So I said, okay, fine. Now I'm in Australia. I'm thinking, it's nice here, you know. Kingston's a long way away. It's two and a half weeks before I have to actually do this talk. And before then, I'm teaching a course in Regina and so on. So three days later, <laughs> Paul. <laughs> just wanted to send you the most up-to-date um, schedule for the program. We're really looking forward to, to seeing you, and where are your slides? <laughs> so, Sarah, 
That's why you got what you got. I sent you slides. I complied. Right? OK. If you're expecting an academic um, presentation, I'm sorry, I'm not an academic. Um, what I am is a practitioner with 30 years plus experience at recruiting, managing, um, leading um, volunteer organizations and um, in senior HR roles, manager, director, and VP roles in domestic and international companies. So somewhere around there, I think we may have learned some things. And what I want to work with you on in the next hour is to pull out what some of the problems and issues are, what some of the opportunities are, and talk to some of what the experience is. At the same time, I will point you towards some resources that you can go to, um, people who have done the research and have done the, the work on it in an academic way, and people who have also published articles and books that you could use if you wanted to read more about this than you could possibly get in 50 minutes from me. Does that make sense? Okay. So first thing I'm going to ask you to do, because I meant it that you're going to work and I'm not, because what am I getting paid for this, Sarah? <laughs> yeah. I, think of it as a contribution to the university, she said. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're welcome. Um, so this is why you're doing the work. So the first question I want to ask you, though, is you've had a couple of really good speakers on succession planning. You're all involved in this all the time. Um, you know what some of the issues are. You know what some of the problems are that you're having. And you may know some things that you want to know more about. So what I'd like you to do is just find somebody close to you who you don't know well. And I'm going to ask you to spend five minutes sharing with them what you haven't heard in the last day that you would like to hear more about. Because that will give us the opportunity then to, to frame this and move this in that direction so that some of those questions get answered. So the question is, find somebody close to you that you don't know that well and share with them what you haven't heard yet that you'd like to hear more about. I'm going to give you five minutes for that. It's 10 past 11. A quarter past, we're starting. All right? Go. I gather from the noise level in the room that there were some issues that you wanted to share with each other. So perhaps um, we could just kind of roll around the room, and you could just give me an idea of what some of those things are that you haven't heard yet that you'd like to hear a bit more about, given that we've got 45 minutes to get this done. Back row up there. Anybody? Yeah. So we had uh, two, two big things that we talked about. One, um, the importance of the pipeline, but what to do before the pipeline is in, in place. And then the second um, piece of succession planning, um, it's a really interesting topic to talk about. And there's a lot of great ideas. How do you action that? Oh. And how do you build that in with the objectives that your group is trying to establish and everything else that you're doing? Given everything else you've got to do. Yes, okay. Yep. Is that ringing bells around the room? Other people? Oh, I'm seeing lots of heads. OK. All right. What else? Yes? We were chatting about the paradox that is you have a really talented person, so you want to bring them on the team. You, but you also have positions and structure. And so if they don't necessarily fit, or do you need a position for them, or what do you do? No, no, you take a square peg, and you take them out, and you go, what? <laughs> right. Isn't that what we do? Right. I was VP of HR. I know how these things work. <laughs> and then we spend all our time complaining to the person that they're a square peg, right? <laughs> then we get into sending them letters, performance reviews, monitoring. Yeah, yeah. Anyone, you, any of you heard of Marcus Buckingham? Marcus Buckingham um, was with the Gallup organization for many years. He's been out on his own now. But he created something called Q12. Q12 is a tool that they use where they ask 12 questions. And they can predict what your turnover is going to be next year from the answer to those 12 questions. Marcus Buckingham says, um, some of you have children, yes? Yeah. OK, so if your kid comes home and your, the report card has 10 A's and a C on it, what do you spend all your time on? <laughs> of course, right? Why? <laughs> when they've got 10 A's. With employees, with volunteers, do we not tend to do the same thing? Does it make any sense? Take the C and give it to Tim. Because that C for Tim is an A. Right? It's an A for him, and he can save your life. Because otherwise, we're going to pound you into the ground. And you're going to be very unhappy, and it's not going to work out. So Marcus Buckingham, have a look for him. He's really good. If you ever get a chance to hear him speak, it's worth it. Um, and if you could ever get him to come and speak to you, it's also worth it. <laughs> 
Of course, he will cost you $50,000 US for an hour and a half. <laughs> All right, what else? Yes? Uh, we talked about managing the, the egos and the difficult conversations egos. that often have to happen around succession planning. So, difficult conversations, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh, and so, how do, like, how do we achieve clarity on when, when it's going to happen, who's going who's to be involved, uh, how to avoid looking like you know, you're trying to push people out? Yeah. Uh, well, of course, and you never ever want to, you never want to look like that. Exactly. Yes. Uh, and, and then the other thing we talked about was that in some ways, good succession planning is also a look into the organization's future. Absolutely. Not just the leader's future. Oh, I like you. I could, I should have paid you to say that. That's good. 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 You, you may All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, mentoring. Mm -hmm. Mentoring. Yes, unless you want to be the chapter president for the rest of your natural life. Maybe you do, but if you don't, um, mentoring is a good idea, right? Where you have a young person who's in a role that yep. they fall into well, the person gets beyond their control, yep. and they're inexperienced. How can you help? How can you mentor? And the crisis organizations are having now, and I talked to, um, I was a speaker at a conference for consulting engineers in Saskatchewan and Regina in January. And any, any of you from Alberta or Saskatchewan? Yeah, good luck recruiting people there. I mean, it's, <laughs> the labor market is just broken. Anybody with any, any that has any flexibility um, and anybody who's kind of floating around has been sucked up to Fort McMurray. Um, any of you, yeah? <laughs> it's your fault, okay. <clears throat> so, yes. Yes, so mentoring. Um, and corporations in general have a problem because in the 1980s, for about 10 years, we stopped hiring people. And right now, we're getting to the point where people like me are about to say, I loved it here, but you know what? I'm moving on. And there's a gap. <clears throat> and it's not just in volunteers. It's in major corporations. There's a whole gap. And there's a lot of people who are younger, enthusiastic, keen. They've got the technical skills, but they've got like squat experience, right? So how do you get that experience into those people quickly? Right? Because you don't have time not to, because otherwise there's going to be this gap in the middle, or you're going to be the chair until you're 80 years old. <laughs> okay, what else? And you, no? Yeah, that was kind of what Cheryl and I talked about. In fact, we come from Mentoring? totally different backgrounds. Cheryl's been with her brand for 25 years. I've been with mine for one. Okay. She's from a small city. I'm from a large city. Oh, so how great you were sitting next to each other. We have the same, same problem in that you know, it's difficult in terms of succession planning, whether you're looking for people who have all the experience and are, seem like are good for the role, or whether you're looking for people with new experience. Uh, bad news for you. Experience. You're never going to find someone who's got all the experience for the role. They barely exist. And again, in Saskatchewan and, and Alberta, forget it. Not happening. But kind of more, more to that point is, you know, whether you're looking for someone in, currently inside or somebody outside, and how uh, the training differs for that kind of yeah, this, this is the build versus buy decision. So just quickly, I mean, in terms of the corporate environment, build versus buy, um, you can always buy somebody in. It's going to cost you a lot of money, and you get their experience from where they came from, which may or may not fit where you are. So what happens with, when you buy somebody in, the chances of them being productive, helpful, and staying for any length of time is less than if you build from inside. The trouble with build from inside is longer. Absolutely, you have to have a plan. So a little bit of an emphasis and a hint of where we're going in the next half hour, planning, numbers, writing things down. So if you went into working with volunteers because you like people, I've got really bad news for you. It's like when I talk to HR people, and he says, why do you go into HR? Because I like people. Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. And the, the executive VP for American Express Worldwide Leadership says, in fact, you should go into line jobs if you like people. You should not go into HR if you like people. And especially these days where it's really very much about metrics measurement and making a plan and following the plan. Right? So those are things that, I don't know, they didn't teach me in HR school. And they don't usually teach you in volunteer school either. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Thank you. Fort McMurray. <laughs> are, you, are you really from the fort? Uh, I just moved up there a year ago, actually. <clears throat> okay. And uh, that's one of the things 
things I want to touch back on uh, what we've spoken about previously as well is that um, one thing that's very unique to Fort McMurray and you find is a very big transitionary city. Uh, a lot of people are always com coming and going on different on stage. shifts and, and yeah. it's always one of those everyone seems to be on a five-year plan or perhaps less. Less. And yeah, they're going to get $175,000 a year for doing a job that's worth 60. Yeah. Yes? <laughs> and they're not staying, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And that's what I find is that um, you have those very young volunteers, and yes. and that flows in a, in a place perhaps as Calgary or Edmonton or Ottawa. And then you look at you have a large pool of people yeah. with the intention to actually settle down, maybe uh, with yeah. families, and that's one thing you don't find in Fort Worth. So it's a very yeah. interesting topic for me to understand succession planning when you're dealing with this. It's going to be an ongoing year by year where people are in and out, and how do you sustain some sort of a process or that engagement level as people come in? Okay. How many of you have been to Fort McMurray? Okay, those of you that have not, you must go. Find a reason to go. Um, it's, it's the most <coughs> amazing. Well, yeah, it's only snow 11 months of the year. Yeah. We, we, <laughs> we, run, we run programs in Fort McMurray. Um, our unit doesn't get any funding from the university. So we kind of have to bring people in and fund ourselves. And we contribute to the university um, funds that taxpayers wouldn't want to pay to do things that the university wants. So it, it's a very good thing, but that means I spent some of my life in Fort McMurray. And the hotels in Fort McMurray, the thing you need to know about them is they're full 100% of the time and they don't give a damn about customer service because it doesn't matter. <laughs> but we'll start with that. When we go and we run our programs there, um, often hotels want to get us to come back. Um, and so there's usually some kind of incentive or some way of talking because if we bring if we run a course in Fort McMurray, we actually get people from across Canada come because it's in Western and so it's easy to get to Fort McMurray. And now you've even got an airport with more than one gate, right? <laughs> Two gates, I know. Um, <clears throat> so th the hotel talked to our business development manager and we, they wanted to offer us an incentive to come to Fort McMurray and they offered us two incentives and we could choose which one we wanted. So one was free underground parking. <laughs> 11 months of a year, it snows, and, and would free underground parking be a good incentive? Yes. The other incentive was they offered us the free porn channel. <laughs> so immediately this picture of me sitting in the principal's office of the university explaining to him <laughs> why we were... <laughs> But <laughs> so I guess what I'm saying is different parts of the country have different motivations that lead people to be involved in, in these things. Right. Okay. Thank you. Who else? Anybody else? Yes. We know the big issue in succession planning is often you're trying to use the networks of the people who are your strongest volunteers yes. to bring in other people who would be like-minded, like-interested. But it's a real challenge. We could have a real discussion about whether that's a good idea or not. Yeah. yeah. Not from, from a diversity point of view, it's a terrible idea. Yeah. But go on. But often it's those, somebody else would be you know, like, like minded or like interested. But that's the problem. You know, and then you, you, get, or you get people to say, well, I don't know who else to bring. Or, yeah. or they, okay. you, you run out of people, basically. You run out of a pool. Of, of yeah, you think you do. You don't actually. Yeah. So, okay, great. Thank you. But, but in other organizations, they said, they had problems. I've had yeah. problems. Okay. I mean, it is wonderful to have a kind of queen's name behind you, right? I mean, that's always a nice thing. Um, and it, it does make, and, and I know you think you're having problems with some of this, but against other organizations, you are not. I mean, the consulting engineers in Saskatchewan are having a terrible time because um, anybody who breathes oxygen and knows anything about engineering has been sucked up to the fort, and that's left the rest of Saskatchewan bereft. And so now Saskatchewan also has a lot of business and a lot of money, National companies are coming into Saskatchewan, setting up offices so they can bid on Saskatchewan business. They are getting the business, they are moving it to Ontario, and they are, then they are outsourcing it to India. So the problem of attracting volunteers, and it, it, this is a global issue now. And of course, in today's world, with everybody being connected to everybody, um, and people wanting to spend all their life on Facebook, what is it that you're gonna offer them that's gonna make them wanna come and actually spend an evening in the rain um, at one of your chapter meetings? Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Our group had uh, come up with two points because we couldn't just agree. Yeah, no. uh, the first uh, point was um, what if you have multiple qualified candidates or perceived qualified candidates, yeah. how do you go about selecting 
Oh, I love that one. That's a great question. Thank you. Uh, so I spent 10 years as, an, as a, in, a recruiter and an interviewer, and I got paid to bring people in. I know how to do this. This, this is a great question. Thank you. The second one was. And I love the problem to have. You've got multiple qualified yeah. people. I mean, your friends over here want to know how you're doing that, yeah. right? So talk to them at lunch, OK? The second question was, um, since succession planning seems to always fall on by the president or the top individual, yeah. how do you ensure no. that you have one? <laughs> Let's start with no. How do you ensure, well, the, yeah. the answer to my second point was, how do you ensure you don't pick someone who's a copy of you or similar to you in terms of your skills, background, talents, yeah. yeah, I mean, it, well, it is a classic problem in recruiting that you hire people that look like you because they're great. <laughs> it's called the halo effect, and you can look it up. I mean, it's, this is one of the, and so in recruiting, one of the biggest problems, and the best advice I can give you on recruiting is don't make up your mind in the first 30 seconds when you meet somebody and then spend the rest of the interview trying to justify the decision you've made. Because that is what the research says we do. We do, right? Don't do it. It is so difficult to keep an open mind, but you really must. So, um, okay, anybody, one last one, anybody? Yes? Sure. We've got a transition process that's stalled. How do we, how do we keep that? Stall transition. You guys don't actually want to do that chapter president in Okanagan job till you're 95? That's a little long. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we need to create like a chapter president emeritus and you can kind of come in and bless people and, and have a few drinks and other people do the work, right? Yeah, okay. All right. Probably, I would say the best piece of advice I'm going to give you, and after this you can go out and have coffee or whatever, is if you are going to be successful in succession planning in volunteers, you really must have someone who is accountable and they must know that they're accountable and they must know what they're accountable for in excruciating detail, please. And so, um, how many of you have, um, you have volunteer boards, right? That, yes, everybody have a volunteer board that you're working, anybody that doesn't here? Okay, so somebody on that board has to be responsible for recruiting volunteers and it must not be the president. President already has enough to do and you don't want their fingers in everything. And this is a good thing to get their fingers out of because when you deal with the volunteer and recruiting volunteers, you're building the future of your organization. Because the people who are on your board should be coming from that pool of volunteers. And if they're not, there's something wrong. So I'm going to ask you to think about over the past five years, how many people have been elected to your board who did not come from your volunteer pool? And if you're going to tell me that most of them did not come from the volunteer pool, then I think you're missing a huge opportunity in terms of development of people and giving people a reason to come and volunteer with you. All right? We start there? All right. I am going to come back to some of the points you made. I'm going to ask you to do another assignment, though, for me, okay? Um, I'm going to give you, then this is a personal one, I'm going to give you like three minutes. So everybody paying attention, more or less? I would like you to write down in two sentences or 35 words or less, why someone should volunteer for you. You meaning you and your volunteer group. Two sentences, 35 words or less, why should someone be a volunteer for you? Okay, how you doing? 35 words, two sentences. If you were in, ever involved in outplacement, or if you've ever been fired from a job and given an opportunity to seek a new career direction, um, someone will counsel you <coughs> on the importance of having elevator chat. So what I'm asking you to do and asking you to put two sentences together with 35 words is create elevator chat. Because many times we're trapped with somebody or we have the opportunity to talk to somebody, we have the opportunity to recruit in just having a conversation, because that's where a lot of recruitment happens, especially for what you need. So you must have 35 words, two sentences that you can talk to somebody about and get them excited about why they should work with you before their eyes glaze over and they go on to something else. So I would like you now to find somebody next to you and I want you to read to them your 35 words and I want them to read to you your 35 words, please. Okay, so did everybody have a chance to back and forth with the 35 words? I, I got a sense there was a lot more than 35 words happening here though, could be wrong. But can I suggest that as an exercise for one of your meetings? That you talk to your volunteers and you ask them to do something like that. 
Um, because now I'm going to give you 45 seconds to go back to your t two sentences, 35 words. And based on what you learned from talking to your colleague, I'll bet most of you would want to change what you said, right? That's because the first time we do it isn't always the best, especially in this kind of thing. So you might want to revise what you did and think about doing this in iterations. But this needs to be like a mantra so that it just comes out of you with sincerity when you're talking to people because you are the best recruiters that you have for your organization. You talk to people all the time. And so if you can't do this well, this is a problem. And there's a lot of research that says, um, the, in the Harvard Business Review last spring, there was an article about can you do strategy. And I mean, so many of us spend so much time going away on strategic retreats. And, and I, when I came to Queens, there was a, a shelf in my office of binders of strategic retreat planning for the last 10 years. Every year they went away and they did strategic plan and strategic retreat. And they put the binder on the shelf and nobody ever did anything. Um, maybe that's a bit too blunt, and I'm, unfortunately they're taping me, so maybe we could, <laughs> can we edit that bit out later? <laughs> but I mean, so what makes a board successful? And I can tell you the two things that I think are the most important things. Number one is courage, and the second is the will to act. Right? Why are you doing this? Because you want to make a difference. You want to improve the world. You want. I mean, there's a reason why you're doing this, and so. It's not just a question of you knowing that, you then have to do something with it. And so that is what is exciting and, and great about working with volunteers for me, I think. So I'd encourage you to work on those sentences and those two sentences are 35 words um, until you're real comfortable with what it is and you can deliver it without being embarrassed and with pride um, and with enthusiasm. And when you can do that, then you can stop, okay? We don't have time to do that now, but that's your homework. I'll be phoning you up individually and saying, <laughs> have you done this or not? Send Sarah. <laughs> well, let's get Sarah to send an email. Um, all right. Oh, slides. Right, slides. So this is what we want, isn't it? Like a, we want a long stream of people coming and wanting to work with us and working to be part of our volunteer work. Yeah, I told you, they're not gonna be little print on slides and I'm not gonna read them, so if that's what you were expecting, it's too bad. Um, well, I like pictures too, and you know, people learn in different ways. There's a thing called Kolb's Learning Style Inventory, and it says, we don't all learn the same way. I know that comes as a shock, especially if you're a parent who has a child who learns in a different way than you learn. That is so incredibly frustrating, right? <laughs> my, my, my nephew in Australia who, you know, um, has a 14-year-old son, and he learns in a completely different way than his parents. His parents are complete and utter overachievers, off the scale, insane. And he just doesn't learn that way. And, he, and so they do not understand how he works or what motivates him. And so they spend a lot of time yelling. It's not effective. And yelling at volunteers usually doesn't work. <laughs> I just, if, you, if you're thinking about trying it, I don't suggest it as a recommended approach. Um, so that's what we want. And I've worked, I mean, I've been on a whole bunch of boards. And the challenge is sometimes what happens, and it was mentioned earlier this morning, is that for young people coming into our organizations, sometimes they see the people that have been there for some time as a clique. They see it as closed. closed and they don't feel welcome. And in that situation, those people will come once, and they're gone. You don't know why they're gone. You know, um, ex do you, how, many do, how many of you do exit interviews with volunteers? Mm, well, you might want to think about that. Um, so exit interviews is when you had somebody, and you liked them, and they left. I think it might be a good idea if you ask them why. So the trick in this, though, is, Christina, if you are the chapter president and you've got a volunteer and they left, you should not be the person doing the interview, all right? Do you know why that is? Well, what's the number one reason why people leave organizations? The number one reason. They don't like the person they work for, for one reason or another. I don't like you, I don't wanna work with you, I hate the style, and 
you're going to come to an exit interview and you're going to say, why am I leaving? And I'm going to say, oh, I just thought I might need a change. Okay? So I strongly interview, recommend exit interviews. You could do them on the phone, do them after a while, and just ask the person, why did they decide to invest their time somewhere else? And do your best to not be defensive. Right? Do not justify, do not say anything. Just mouth shut, ears open. Right? Hard to do, but it's very important. And someone needs to do that, and it shouldn't be the person that manages the volunteers. It should be somebody at the other end. Right? So you've got somebody who's managing people coming in, and you've got somebody managing people going out. And it's kind of a fun thing if you want to give somebody an opportunity to do something different, especially if they are good at receiving feedback. And there are books you can look at on how to give feedback and how to receive feedback. So I don't recommend, Peter, boy, are you ever stupid. You know, you really screwed this up, and I am so sorry that you came in today. <laughs> right? Well, how many, how many people have volunteers who come to, come to your chapters because they decided they really want to screw things up? <laughs> now, we have employees that do that, but, but not volunteers, right? So you have to, you know, people don't come because they want to fail. They don't come because they want to feel unhappy. They don't come because, right? So and we talked earlier this morning about some of the reasons why people come. And so I, I don't plan to, to, to repeat what she said this morning. I thought what she said was very, very good. Um, but X interviews will tell you a lot, especially if you look at it systemically, which is how many volunteers left your organization in the last year, two years ago, three years ago? What percentage of your total volunteers is that? Anybody know that statistic? Probably not, right? I think you should try and collect that stuff. And you've probably got the information you need to do that. And then say, what do I want that turnover to be? Am I happy with where that number is? Because if you're hemorrhaging on this end, what does it do to the other end, the recruitment end? So if you can figure out why people are leaving and correct the systemic issues that are causing them to lead, you'll have a lot less trouble finding the volunteers to stay. Does that make sense? So that's why it's worthwhile thinking about this systemically, about doing the exit interviews, even though this isn't a corporate thing. Right? It doesn't necessarily take a long time. And if you talk to some of the people, you'll quickly find that some of the reasons you thought they left had nothing to do with why they left. Right? Um, and yes, it's true. We all have huge demands on our time. Um, we all have other things to do. Um, but still, people make a choice to leave or not come back, one or the other. So also, the statistic, how many people have gone from your volunteer group to the board of directors? How many should, right? There should be a plan, and people should be tapped on the shoulder. You know. We think you're doing a really great job. We want to give you something to do that's a bit different because we're thinking you might be interested in three to five years of joining our board. Would that be something that might interest you? All right? Okay, then let's look at the skills and abilities and competencies that you need to be a successful board member. Let's look at where you are. Let's look at what the gap is, and let's fix it over the next three to five years. Do you think you might engage him and have him stay if you have that kind of conversation? All right? You're not making any promises. You're just saying, we think you have talent. We want to work with you. We want to work with you and help you grow. And this is especially true for younger volunteers who may not be getting that kind of experience in their workplace. Right? So you can actually lead their training in what you do and prepare them for better jobs. And if you help them get a better job where they work, do you think they're going to be loyal? Yeah, of course they are. And if you're a chapter leader and you're trying to, to move on, do you not think you have to share this and pass this over? in a systemic way again. And you see this now, I mean, um, Queens has a great program on corporate governance, and we did a program with Deloitte um, a couple years ago on corporate governance, and a lot of it is around um, transferring of knowledge, right? The corporate governance now, if you look, and I'm gonna show you a couple of examples in the slides, and there are slides that are useful later. <laughs> um, but where there's a list of competencies for board members. Do you have a list of competencies for people who are on your board? Some of you do. Do you have a list of competencies for volunteers? Some of you do, right? Do you actually recruit people based on that, or you just hire anyone who breathes oxygen? <laughs> I, know what, I know what you do in the fort, but... <laughs> the so 
having that criteria helps you when you're trying to source people, right? Um, and of course, it is to some extent a numbers game, which is you need to talk to a lot, I mean, you need to kiss a lot of frogs, right? To find a prince. Um, and I, I do think that you're going to talk to a lot of people who aren't the least bit interested, aren't qualified, don't have the talent, don't have the competencies, and don't want to have anything to do with queens. Okay. Um, would you like to give money then? <laughs> <laughs> but then you move on, right? I mean, it's, it's um, it, it, that was um, not a no, it's just a yes without enough information, and you go back to them later, right? But if you have that list of competencies that you're looking for, it gives you something you can actually talk to people about. And you can ask them, How, what do you think you're good at here? Is there something that we could interest you in, right? Um, somebody must be responsible on the board for volunteer recruitment and not the president. Do I need to say that again? Have you got that? Anyone want to argue with me about it? I don't recommend it, but you can. <laughs> All right. And, and it, it needs to be accountable. So at a board meeting, I don't know how often you have your board meetings, but quarterly, monthly, monthly or quarterly, right. At some point during the year, there should be a hardwired agenda item, volunteer recruitment. And the person who's on the board who's responsible for it, you make them stand up at the front, you say what they're doing and what they've done and how successful they've been. And if they haven't been successful, you fire them and get somebody else. There is nothing more important than that job. You need to support them and help them do what they're asked to do. You need to get someone who wants to do it. But if you don't, you're making it difficult all the way down the pipeline and the chain, right? Um, David Clutterbuck, if you haven't heard of him, he's kind of fun. Um, he says that when you think about a talent pool, he thinks stagnant, closed in, not growing. When he thinks about pipeline, he thinks about forcing things into a pipe, into a, into a kind of a hole, and then putting pressure on it and blowing it out the end, and that's <laughs> not really quite right either. Um, so he's recently got a book called The Talent Wave, and he talks about succession planning and why typically it fails. One of his fundamental questions is, if succession planning works so well in our organizations, why do so many megalomaniacs get to the top of our organizations? <laughs> I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> but it is an interesting question, isn't it? Um, if I ask you, if we're talking about succession planning for our jobs and our roles uh, in, in our lives, how many of you would like to be treated with dignity, respect, and in an open way when it comes to talking about succession, your particular succession and your future? Dignity, open, OK. How many of us work for organizations that do that? Some of you, right? Every audience I talk to, it's the same. We all say we want to do it. The organizations don't. So you have a chance in your volunteer life to do that right. And I really encourage you to try it. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. Being honest is always a problem, right? Especially when you have to have difficult conversations. But there's all kinds of books about how to have those difficult conversations. And the other thing is, and if you have to have a difficult conversation, so Tim, if I have to actually help you move on to a new career opportunity, um, what I'm going to do the day before is I'm going to sit down with George and practice what I'm going to say to you. And George is going to be you, and he's going to say exactly what, right? There's nothing embarrassing or wrong about practicing before you give somebody the boot, right? right? <laughs> or give them an opportunity to move on. And we, and we have to do that. So how much turnover do you want on your volunteer group? Would you be happy if it was none? Mm, no, OK. So then, <laughs> this is, um, you know, there's a famous Winston Churchill story about Lady Astor, where he says to her, you probably know this. I hear somebody laughing already. Yeah, you, you, he says to her, so um, if I gave you um, 10,000 pounds, would you sleep with me? Right? Um, and she says, no. And he says, OK, well, now we're opening the negotiations. <laughs> So what do you want the volunteer turnover to be? What's the right place? And I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for you, because it's going to vary with where you are geographically, with the kind of the demographics of your group, and so on. But you need a certain amount of turnover, and you need to plan for it, and you need to encourage it. Right? That doesn't mean 
that we're going to let Tim escape from us just because in the current role he's been there too long, he's a bit stale, and people are sick and tired of working with him. <coughs> what we are going to do is move him into a board member emeritus job. We're going to value him. We're going to thank him for what he's done. And we are going to ask his opinion on a regular basis and keep him engaged with us and get him out of the way of everybody else. <laughs> In, in the nicest possible way. I mean, but does that make sense? Right? So if you've got somebody who's blocking, that's the kind of thing I would recommend you do. You're retaining them. You're still getting the benefit of their expertise in a positive way, and you're being positive, good with them, and people are getting to see. Who is you? Do you need consensus from the rest of the board? Are you in <coughs> or how, how, do you, how do you affect that if they are in charge and they have a, an mm. Oh, how do you, how do you um, put, how do you bell the cat? Yes. Especially if they're the one that's been there for 30 years and hasn't moved. Yes. Well, <clears throat> the board presumably is who elected that person. So in the grand scheme of things, the board, of course, can unelect them. But what I would do is I would, I would do it around competencies and, and change and you don't, there's a, you know, there's a certain, I work with a guy named Gary Furlong. He says, after seven years in your job, you need a new clown suit. And there is a, there's a time at which you can talk to somebody and say, you know, we really need someone else to have the experience for a year or two of being president. And we could really use you to help them. And what we're hoping is that you might be willing to become past president and help this person become the best president we've ever had. Because they can't do it without you. Uh, many boards have a president-elect, president, past president. Um, and I mean, I love having a past president because I can th give them all the really horrible, crappy political stuff because <laughs> they've been around, right? <laughs> I mean, you know how to deal with that stuff, right? You may have caused some of it yourself, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> so, but you move, but you, you, and so you give them an opportunity for a new direction at the same time um, acknowledging their, their skills, their ability, and thanking them for what they've done. And, and you may find that that might help. Um, if not, of course, you can always go somewhere else. <laughs> um, it is a very difficult thing. Um, the other thing, and this is where you get to bylaws. I know people hate bylaws, hate them, hate them, hate them. I, I really like bylaws because the bylaws tell you how things are supposed to be. So if your bylaw does not have a sunset clause on how long somebody can be on your board, then I re recommend you rewrite your bylaws and do it now. Not only how long can somebody be on the board, but that the fact they have to get off and not come back. Because a lot of them, you get a six year and then you can come, you can go away for a year and come back. Oh, God help us, right? Um, so I don't know how long that should be, but your, board, your bylaws should encourage that kind of movement. And when you're setting expectations for volunteers, you should also encourage some kind of movement, right? Um, you could always send them to the Fort McMurray chapter. They're looking for people, right? Does that answer your question? Yeah? OK. I don't know what the next slide is. Shall we see? Oh, yeah. There are lots of people available. And sometimes they're in places where we don't normally look. Um, in Saskatchewan, anybody from Saskatchewan here? No. All right. What do you think the fastest growing group of people in Saskatchewan is? Fastest growing group? Absolutely. Aboriginals. Companies in Saskatchewan that do not have a successful outreach program in the Aboriginal community are going to be very sorry very soon. All right? They need to look somewhere where they haven't looked before and see talent where they haven't seen it before. I'm talking to you. All right? If you're always looking in the same places, try and think about where else you might look where you haven't looked before. Right? And one place, and uh, Deloitte does this incredibly well, <coughs> is in your own alumni network. So this is the volunteers that you used to have that left should be a really good source for people to come back. And you shouldn't be shy about going back to them in three to five years after they've left and said, OK, now your kids are older. You know, your, your wife is back from, from serving in Afghanistan, and we've got time now, maybe. Maybe we could go back and start over, and maybe you'd like to come back and work with us again. Those people, you already had them. You liked them. You didn't want them to leave. They did a good job. Why wouldn't you call them up? 
And here's a way to do it that's kind of fun, is um, when you have one of your board meetings, why don't you have a wine and cheese reception afterwards? Or it can be cake. Generally, if there's food, people will come. <laughs> have people come and update them on what's going on. Have a newsletter that you send out to the people that used to be volunteers with you. If they want to delete it, they can delete it. If they want to unsubscribe, they can unsubscribe. But keep them in the loop. Tell them the exciting things that are going on. Tell them you're looking for a volunteer to lead something and see if anybody calls you. Sometimes they will, you know? Um, and just going for an open call for volunteers. I mean, I know many of you think you have done this. But this is one of those things is you cannot ask too many times the same people, really, the same group. So if uh, presumably Queen's alumni sends you a list or will send something out to anyone and everyone who's a Queen's graduate in Fort McMurray by postal code or something like that. Is that right? Yes, they'll help you with that. So how often are you using that facility to get the message out that you're looking for more volunteers? How often? Every two weeks, okay? Calgary, you yeah, know, well. <laughs> yeah, Calgary's an amazing place right now. Um, it's, okay. I mean, you need to keep in touch and give people a reason to want to work with you, right? Um, I mean, it need, does it not need to be fun, too? I mean, God, life is, like, so many things in life are just not so great. It's nice to go do some volunteer work with people you like, where you have a couple of, of yucks, you have a, a, a few jokes, or, and then you do some hard work, right? The hard work can be bunched in the middle, and then it can be sandwiched with the fun. Um, but if you're not having fun doing this, then you need to, of course, ask the question, who would want to stay with you? Um, other thing is, if you look at who your most successful volunteers are now, and you can make a list in your head of who they are, then I'd like you to say, where did they come from? And how did they hear about us? Look for the systemic reasons that brought you the kind of people that you like working with, and then go back there. Don't forget that for diversity reasons, there's all kinds of reasons why you need to work in other places, because you do not want everyone to look like you. But that's a way if there is some, and you may find there's systemic issues that you hadn't thought of that are why people are coming. So it's not just why people are leaving, but why are they coming, and who are the best ones, and where did they come from, and how did they meet you? Does that make sense? Um, next slide. Ah, yes. Most volunteer organizations have um, some issues with some people in some places around entitlement. Um, I'm one of these people that believes you just have to blow that up and no matter how difficult it is, you have to confront it um, because it sucks the energy out of you and it also blocks change. Um, so I'm glad to talk to any of you later about some ways and techniques for dealing with that, but most of you may have some people somewhere who think, I've been in charge of the wine for the last 10 years and I'm going to continue to be in charge of wine until I die. <laughs> You're laughing, but you're laughing with me, right? Yeah. <laughs> so give them a chance to be involved in something else, like cleaning the washrooms. <laughs> a um, couple of things. If you want to read a book about succession planning, the best one available is called Effective Succession Planning by William J. Rothwell. And it's like 14th edition. Um, it's very good. It's got all kinds of forms in it you can get from the library. Um, it's not an academic book in that sense, but it's got forms and approaches and, and flip charts and all kinds of things in it. Um, if you ever get the chance to hear William J. Rothwell, don't. He's the most boring speaker on the planet. <laughs> but he's really good at succession planning and he knows what he's doing. And so what he has is something called the seven-pointed star. And we're at 12 here, so... Um, Sarah, 10 more minutes? Can I do that without getting the wrath of the people in the room? May I ask permission for 10 more minutes? Is that okay? All right. So there's a seven-pointed star, and I will get this to you, Sarah, and maybe you could distribute it or if people want it. Um, so there are seven steps. Step number one to having successful succession planning. Step number one is make the commitment. 
If you do not find people who are willing to commit to leading this, to making it work, to running it, to measuring it, reporting on it, and doing the work, then please don't do this at all. Just stay where you are. Because <laughs> the worst thing you can do is start to do something like this and then not do it successfully. So make the commitment. And there are some lovely lists in that book of what that means and how you do that. Right? How do you get commitment from people? How do you know if you've got it? How can you prioritize creating commitment? Right? Number two, assess the present work and people requirements. So what do you need to make this chapter run and make it be better than those darn people in Calgary who never shut up about how good they are, right? <laughs> oh, sorry, you're in the room, I forgot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Number three, appraise individual performance. Do you do performance reviews on your volunteers? No. Why not? Honestly, why not? Why don't you sit down with them once a year and say, these are the things you're doing that we just love. There are some other things we'd like you to do. And here are some things that we'd like to suggest we might help you with. So I'm not saying that this has to be in any way a, um, a negative experience for anybody. I think it's respectful to say, this is how we respect your time. These are the things that you're doing that add value to what we're doing, and we're grateful. And here are some other ideas. So it doesn't have to be fancy. You could have a one-page piece of paper. And whoever is in charge of volunteers once a year, you fill out this piece of paper with people's name. Right? And you can have things on it like, there were 12 meetings, and uh, Kelly showed up for two. Well, that's a perfect time to have the conversation about how committed are you and why can't you come to our meetings? And if you hear, I can't come to your meetings because they're always on Tuesday night, then you might want to consider moving the meetings around so they're not always on Tuesday night, if you can manage to do that, because that's not such a terrible thing to change, if that will get somebody there who you want in the room. All right, so appraising performance. Assessing your future needs. So do you do an, an strategic plans for the chapters? Yes. Yes, people have plans. Like five years from now, do you know where you want to be, what you want to be doing, how many volunteers you want, what you're going to be doing with those volunteers? Hmm. You might want to think about it, um, because that's where having the vision allows you to provide the leadership, allows you to get people excited, and helps everybody get everybody on the same page. They're all going the same direction. There's a slide about that later. OK. So some kind of plan. And it doesn't need to be a binder on a shelf. God help us, that's not what we want. What we want, though, is something we can all agree to that comes from the board, that the board has discussed, that comes to you and says, this is where we're going. This is what we're trying to achieve. Because when you do that, then you can assess your future needs against the current people. And you can see what the gaps are between what they need and what they have. And you can then start talking to them about how we develop them, how we work with them, and how we grow the organization. And of course, the last thing you want to do on succession planning is you want to evaluate how well you've done. <laughs> All right? And right now, you're in a place where many of you, I think, you're not really even collecting the numbers yet. So collect the numbers. Look at what you currently have. Look at what you need in the future. Look at the training opportunities. Develop a plan. Work with the individuals. None of this actually takes a huge amount of time. It just takes a plan. It needs someone to be accountable and responsible. Remember what I said earlier? Someone needs to be responsible for the volunteer side of what it is in your organization and responsible for specifically for recruiting volunteers. And all the rest of this kind of falls out of that. OK, I'm going to show the slides. Okay. But I mean, we want something where we can be proud of what we've done and, and where we've done it. I mean, it's, I'm very proud to work at Queens. I love working here. Um, and it's a great place to work. I get to go across the country, actually around the world, and talk to people. And usually I get paid for it. And <laughs> I, no, I didn't mean that. No, no. I, I'm grateful that you called me. I really am. Um, because this is quite a different group than I normally talk to. Right? And so for me, it's exciting to have the opportunity to, to tell you how I think some of the stuff that happens in the corporate world can actually be used effectively in volunteer. Um, here's some places to look. 
Um, McMaster University, the Groot School of Business, has Directors College. Rotman has the Institute of Corporate Directors. And of course, Queen's Executive Ed has a governance program. Um, any of those sites will, will spill out all kinds of information that's available for free. So I'd be, go I'd be going and looking. This is around measurement, keeping track of things and having a sense of where you want to go. If you don't have a plan for where you want to go, how do you know when you got there? And you should be doing that with the volunteers, right? Just like you do it with the financials. You, how much time do you spend with the financials? Lots, right? How much time do you spend appraising volunteers, recruiting volunteers, and talking about volunteers? Make it part of your regular board meetings to have some kind of discussion about volunteers and have somebody come and talk about it. Uh, this is um, just a statement about the skills and experience of people who are going to be nominated for directors, what they need to have. Um, so areas of skills and experience, not-for-profit sector, and um, this, the table I'm going to show you shows the experience, qualifications, attributes, and skills that people are need. And across the top, which ones people have. This you can work with your volunteers on. You can create this kind of a table. You can see where the gaps are. You can see where the development needs are. And you can talk to people in a realistic, positive way about what they might want to do in the future when they get to see what some of the other opportunities are. This is corporate governance at the top level, but there's no reason that this can't be brought down. <coughs> Indian Pacific, Calgary. Which, oh, there we go. Calgary. These are good people. Um, the VP of Canadian Pacific for people, um, Peter Edwards, is a great guy. If you don't know him, he's worth talking to. Um, Queens grad, MIR, and um, he comes and does all kinds of work for us <coughs> for free um, that you might, if you're looking for somebody to speak at a chapter meeting, um, he's very good. And here's what they have. You see that it, in some detail. You can steal this stuff, folks, right? Steal it. <laughs> Modify it to match the needs for your organization. Change the titles. But the content is there, and it tells you what somebody needs. That's from Canadian Pacific's annual report. Came out last month. OK? You see the list that, again, I mean, I can give, Sarah, I can give you the, and you can distribute that, yeah? If anyone would find that worth, worthwhile. This is not rocket science. It doesn't take a huge amount of time. You don't have to do examinations. You have to, don't have to take a 13-week course three hours a week, right? You can do that fairly closely, I would have thought. So sometimes we need a new clown suit. Just need to look at what we do and look at it in a different way. Um, have fun at what we're doing. Provide recognition for everyone who contributes their time and their effort to support what you do. Um, recognition means different things to different people. And so um, I want to give you an example. We, work with, we do quite a lot of work with Fairmont Hotels. And we go to the Empress in Victoria. And they had a woman there who had 25 years experience in housekeeping, and she was going to retire. And um, in terms of recognition for her, they did not give her a watch. You'd be glad to hear. They said to her, you've been here 25 years cleaning rooms. What would you like for us to do for you to recognize your transition into retirement? So in the courtyard behind the Empress Hotel one morning at break time, there was a steel drum with a fire in it. And she and her friends came to the steel drum, and they stood beside it. She took off her shoes, and she threw them in the fire. <laughs> That's what she wanted, to recognize the transition, to get rid of the housekeeping shoes. You can ask people. you know, And often what they want in terms of recognition doesn't actually cost a lot of money. Right? It's, it's about looking somebody in the eye and sincerely thanking them for um, what they've contributed and what they've done. And just as I'm going to look you right in the eyes now and thank you for inviting me, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to have this talk with you. I've really enjoyed it. So uh, we'd like to thank Paul very much for coming in. Um, it was a very thought-provoking and candid conversation, I think, for all of us. Don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> there you are.
No, a little anecdotic story. I was looking through the slides to get some background information to, to help introduce Paul, and I see a bunch of pictures of people in lineups and clown costumes, and I said, this doesn't help me very much for my introduction. So, um, But anyway, thank you very much. And, and no, I'm not going to pull out any funding for coming here, but we do have one of these fancy banana, banana colored blankets for you. So thank you very much. That's what I always great. wanted. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.